Welcome to our latest in our monthly series of EdSource Roundtables. My name is Ann Vasquez, Executive Director of EdSource. California has been in the throes of rethinking new guidelines for math education in public schools. At the heart of the discussion is closing the racial and socioeconomic disparities in achievement that persist at all levels of math education. The State Board of Education has pushed back to 2023 the adoption of what's known as the California Math Framework. As we wait, EdSource is here to help foster thoughtful discussions about approaches to instruction. Today, we want to address some of the pressing issues, including how much math all students need to succeed post high school in whatever field they choose. Most importantly, we want to see how we might find some common ground for a way forward. If you haven't already, we encourage you to follow us on Twitter and sign up for our daily newsletter. It's a great way to stay in the know about all things education. And lastly, EdSource would not be able to bring us all together for this event if it weren't for the support of our funders, including the Gates Foundation, for making today's roundtable possible. Now for our introductions. First, I'd like to welcome to our panel, Rory Abernethy, a math teacher and coach at San Francisco Unified School District. Please also welcome Kendall Brown, Executive Director of the California Mathematics Project Statewide Office. Next, I'd like to introduce Brian Conrad, Professor of Mathematics and Director of Undergraduate Studies in Math at Stanford University. I'd like to also welcome Brian Lindemann, Co-Faculty Director of the Center for Science and Mathematics Instruction at California State University, Chico. Brian also chaired the committee that drafted the California Math Framework. Next, I'm happy to introduce, to introduce Cole Sampson, an Administrator of Professional Learning and Student Support for the Kern County Superintendent of Schools. Lastly, please welcome Kate Stevenson, math professor at California State University, Northridge. And also thank you to all of those working behind the scenes today who are helping to answer all of your questions. Our moderator today is EdSource Editor-at-Large, John Fensterwall. Welcome everyone, and John, I will pass it on to you. Thank you, Anne. So before we begin, it's important to remember that a well-written framework is but one component to raising math achievement. We need well-prepared teachers in all schools who build positive mindsets in math. We need well-written materials and textbooks that engage all students. We need equal access to courses that prepare students for college and career choices. These do not currently exist in many low-income, predominantly Hispanic and Black high schools. Without them, a framework, however clear and inspiring, will have minimum impact. But even though a framework provides guidelines and is not a mandate, we know it's important because hundreds of people wrote comments and thousands of people signed letters supporting and criticizing it in the latest round of public comment. And more than a thousand people registered for this roundtable to spend a midsummer afternoon to discuss it. This roundtable will be part of that public record. To the extent that our panelists provide answers to your questions, clarify misunderstandings, and provide solutions to seemingly intractable disagreements, this hour will be well spent. As with all of our roundtables, we want this to be a conversation. To start, Brian Lindemann, you chaired the writing committee for the framework. Take a couple of minutes, if you will, to remind us what a math framework is and the highlights of this framework and why it's different from the last one. Brian. So uh, for the past three years, I have had the pleasure of leading the writing team's work on this math framework. I thank them and the many, many panels and groups and the public which have offered their input uh, in the process. From the CDE website, uh, the framework provides guidance for math learning for all students at all levels of math, including calculus, and ensures students have a wide variety of options including uh, pursuing science, technology, engineering, and mathematics in college and career. Uh, the math framework is revised every eight years, according to state law. Um, there were focus groups and uh, convened three years ago, and from those framework guidelines were drafted, and then from those guidelines that informed the process uh, sort of thereafter for both the writing team and uh, the various groups that gave feedback to the, to the writing team. Um, some stance, some key stances from the framework. Uh, I think the pivotal stance is that all students are capable of accessing and achieving success in school mathematics. Um, I'll unpack that just a little bit. Uh, students learn best when they are actively engaged in questioning, struggling, problem solving, reasoning, communicating, 
making connections and explaining. Uh, secondly, all students deserve powerful mathematics. High level mathematics achievement is not dependent on rare natural gifts, but rather can be cultivated. That's another underlying stance of the framework. <laughs> Lastly, access to an engaging and humanizing education, a socio-cultural human endeavor is a universal right. Students' cultural backgrounds, experiences, and language are resources for learning mathematics. All students, regardless of background, language of origin, differences, or foundational knowledge are capable and deserving of depth of understanding and engagement in rich mathematical tasks. A couple of just key features in particular, uh, math learning is deepened through inspiring curiosity with investigations, hence why investigating is a key part of this framework, and forming connections to other related topics, why connecting is also a, a, an important piece. Lastly, big ideas form an essential piece in terms of content connections, which are math ideas and themes which span TK-12, and uh, grade level big ideas, which are groupings of standards at each grade level. And lastly, drivers of investigation, which are motivations for learning math. Um, and those are also meant to interweave with the standards for mathematical practice, which I'll just point out is something that we really wanted to highlight in this framework, which uh, was given some attention in the prior framework, but really in the framework guidelines, we were called on to make that even more prominent. Thank you. Um, Brian Conrad, you wrote prolifically as a critique of the uh, standards. And I wonder if you could start, uh, give us for a couple minutes on what changes you think need to be made and why. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> thanks, John. Uh, thanks everyone for being here. Um, so I should begin by saying, so I'm the son of a high school math teacher. And so I've had a, a strong interest in you know quality and I'm a graduate of the public schools. I'm a strong interest in quality public education uh, in math uh, for a long time. And, you know, I agree, you know, we all want, as, as Brian Lindman was just saying, you know, students from all backgrounds should learn math in ways that convey the relevance and, you know, balance conceptual understanding and uh, procedural fluency. Um, so I, I read the entire document and um, I think maybe I'll just give a, maybe three, three of the uh, things that I, I noticed that I commented upon. Uh, where I think there could be uh, improvements made. Uh, first of all, uh, so there is a lot of uh, sort of citation misrepresentation. So papers maybe assert one thing, or papers are said to assert one thing, but the paper says something else, sometimes opposite of the conclusions. And so I think it's important to go back and, and fix those up so that when public policy is based on uncited research, so that the conclusions are you know accurately uh, accurately described. Um, there are certainly courses which historically have a very, very problematic outcomes, uh, particularly, for example, Algebra 2. Um, and the need to improve pedagogy and motivation uh, shouldn't be conflated with the uh, continued importance of the content. So, for example, QR codes rely on polynomial algebra, noise canceling headphones rely on unit circle trigonometry. And, and so I think some balance between the need to improve pedagogy while not you know, while also providing modern motivation um, is, is something that we can, you know, try to do better on uh, during the next next revision process uh, with covering the content standards. And the, the last thing I'll uh, just comment on is that if we think about where the math education goes post high school, for those who do go on to college, college degrees and quantitative fields far beyond engineering, you know, economics, data science, statistics, computer science, neuroscience, these all require algebra two, but often nowadays they require calculus uh, if you want to do data science, computer science. Um, and so even though, for example, Berkeley's intro data science course needs algebra two only to go any further at Berkeley in data science, you need calculus. And so the preparedness to learn calculus early in college uh, remains very important uh, for fields beyond just traditional physics and engineering. And so this should also be kept in mind in the advocacy that's given for alternative pathways and choices towards the end of high school for all students. Good. Thanks. Thanks, Brian. I think we're going to turn, spend a lot of time on high school pathways in this next hour, I think uh, a little later. And, and I wondered if any other panelists have initial comments or reactions to what they've heard or reactions to the framework. Sure, yeah, I'd like to uh, respond to something that Brian Conrad said when he talked about um, the um, no, the number of fields that require calculus in college. According to a study by LearningWorks and Pace, 
uh, among two-year college uh, programs of study, 80% of them do not require calculus. And among four-year college uh, programs of study, 72% do not require calculus. And while I love calculus as much as anybody else, and I'd love for everybody to take it and be successful in it, you know, if we're looking at the reality of the, um, you know, what's happening in the academic, uh, you know, on campuses and in the real world, we do need to have options and think about people who are not going to be taking calculus and are going to be entering fields that don't require calculus. Yeah, Brian. Yeah. yeah, so I completely agree uh, with what Kendall said that um, certainly there are, so I was, when I was speaking before, I was referring to, you know, quantitative fields and sort of as time goes on, more and more of those are requiring it in ways that wasn't the case, let's say in the past, but certainly for students, I completely support the idea that there should be multiple options towards the end of high school for, you know, whether statistics or other, other courses. Um, and we should hopefully in the CMF provide messaging to students, you know, if you want to keep different options open, here are the things that will be available if you do this or that. Um, but I, I completely agree that providing more options towards the end of high school would be very valuable to do. Now, before we go uh, even further, it might be helpful, John, if we talk about what is a curricular curriculum framework and what is it not? I wonder if that's something that we can address right now at the outset. Sure. Who's the best definition for this math framework to Well, we know who uses it, right? We, we, we find teachers are looking forward to this. And, and I think that's come out uh, clearly in focus groups, right? I mean, they really want some guidance as to how to increase math uh, achievement for all students. And, and we know it's used by textbook publishers as guidance. But uh, what, what else does it serve? Brian Lindemann. Well, I, I just, I guess I just want to uh, yeah. clarify for folks that it's not necessarily a statement of what to teach that's already mandated by the state of California. That's the common core standards. We are in California are a, are a common core standard state, um, but it is more of the uh, how to teach. It's more of the connecting what to teach to the actual classroom setting. So it's meant to sort of bridge that um, in ways that are flexible enough for districts to, to, to decide what makes the most sense for them. Um, so again, it's meant to be uh, information, guidance, it's not policy, um, and districts can make the best choices that they, that they can. Yeah, Kate. Uh, I think it's important to keep in mind while these are sometimes, the framework is sometimes called an aspirational document, it's a little more than that because it's really supposed to direct. And what we would like to do is have a directional do document be something that's actionable, something that with the resources that we currently have, or perhaps with 20% more resources, but we should spell that out, these are the actions that we can take to improve the situation. And I think that's one place where the current framework could be greatly improved, that it is extremely long. <laughs> it took those of us who actually read the whole time, take quite a long time to get through. And I feel like by being so long, it, it's, its clear message is it becomes muddied and the directional uh, power becomes uh, a little bit hard to parse. And also I feel like it's a little bit too uh, ambitious and so, or maybe quite a bit too much too ambitious based on my experience, 10 years working with high school math teachers and working in the CSU with the output of the high school, current high school program. I think we need to be a little more incremental, not, not in a passive way. We need to be bold in terms of our objectives, but we need to be realistic about how to get to them. So that's one place where right. I'd like to see a little um, Cole, I see you're shaking your head. I'm not sure who you're agreeing with, <laughs> but go ahead and, 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 and respond if you will. This document has to be ambitious. I, as I think about the data in, you know, for the students of California, 70% of them are not meeting standard. There are 70% of our kids across the board that are not meeting at standards. Uh, and we need this aspirational document to kind of set the stage. And that's where the rollout is going to come into support. That's where the professional development is going to come into support. Um, that's where we're going to be working with curriculum developers uh, to help bring some of this to light. But we have to have that North Star. We have to move beyond what we've done for decades and that have given us the same results for a long period of time to change outcomes for kids. Um, and so I, I applaud kind of the work that is in here to kind of push that forward. Rory. Um, 
from a high school teacher, you're you're the only high school teacher on the panel. So what? <laughs> tell us how does this affect the way you teach and how affect the way your students learn and and there's a lot of emphasis on equity in the framework. What will that mean? How will it translate to you and your students? So um, I just kind of bear with me to give you kind of context for my sort of stance on this. And that is my, um, you know, my last name is Abernathy. My great grandfather was a mathematician from Wales. He married a daughter of a slave, taught all his kids math. Um, when my grandfather rolled around, his grandson he was sent to schools to do math problems as a show and tell and able to use the white library. Then all of his brothers got degrees in chemistry, um, but he was the only one that was actually hired as an actual chemist and not a lab assistant. Um, I'm third generation Berkeley and um, at Berkeley during, you know, those three, three generations, you know, even though we all ended up with STEM degrees, we endured a lot of racism. When I, um, went to middle school, I was told, you know, under this track system, even though I qualified, overqualified for the algebra class and the algebra track, I was told there was no room. And then as I talked to my friends, my black friends and my brown friends, they were told the same thing. And then when I got to college, I found hundreds of stories, at, you know, throughout Berkeley, Stanford, Harvard, different universities and different friends that I encountered where they were told the same thing. Then as I became a teacher, I saw so many of my students who were, had completed certain requirements in middle school and somebody just looked at them and placed them in the wrong class or created barriers for them to do mathematics at the level that they were qualified to do. So when I came to San Francisco as a teacher, I was very excited about detracking because there should never be a, a, a situation where an arbitrary adult or an arbitrary um, person can decide whether or not you pursue, you know, um, deeper mathematics. So um, in terms of equity, I would like to see acceleration opportunities that don't involve tracking. And then I think what this framework does, and I want to point to the vision of it, and we do need to think bigger, and we can't say not now, because if not now, then when? We have to look at, um, in the framework, it talks about the detracking because it takes that element out of there. And this is for um, English language learners who are put in the wrong track because their, their language skills aren't good enough um, or SPED students who are maybe put in a different track. I think that acceleration options should be detracked and they should be 100% family choice. Um, what that does is it begins to then um, give us the opportunity to sort of you know, chart our own path. And then it, and then it creates diversity because then a, a district or a school system is then um, tasked with looking at the supports that are involved and in letting any student pursue acceleration at their own pace. Right now, if you look up and down the state of California or even nationally, the lower track classes look like the bottom of a slave ship, black and brown bodies, right? And then if you look at the history of just my family, is it because they didn't qualify to be in those higher track classes or whether it's their intrinsic and systematic racism? So as I look in my classroom and I look at each student, what I like about the framework is that it also provides, um, it, I think the equity toolkit was removed, but it at least alludes to the fact that as teachers, we need to have these conversations and not make assumptions about our students when they come in the room. And that, that you have to have the intrinsic belief that all students can do mathematics and that all students can do mathematics with rigor. So that's where I see how the framework is so important to begin those conversations and provide the sort of language and tools to have those conversations within our um, um, K-12 schools. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think one of the questions is, can the, the framework deliver what it promises in the way that it's constructed and, and, how, and the way the chapters read? And one of the differences um, is that this talks about and emphasizes uh, big ideas. And for those who haven't read the the uh, framework, what what are what is a big idea, and and do other think do others think that this is a useful approach um, that will advance math? Kindle, good luck. All right. So you know, um, when the ninety eight framework came out, it was the first time that each uh, grade level and each course 
had been there was an actual list of standards that a, a teacher was supposed to cover in each course or each grade level. And, you know, a lot of teachers interpreted that to mean that I need to cover standard number one, and then I need to cover standard number two, and then I need to cover standard number three. Um, and, and, and that builds to what Van der Waal calls an instrumental understanding of mathematics, this belief that mathematics are these discrete individual ideas that aren't connected to one another. And what this whole idea of big ideas is about is thinking about um, mathematics in ways that uh, cluster these kinds of standards together. For example, one big idea is this notion of representation, right? That you can represent the solution to a problem in words, numbers, symbols, pictures, or graphs, right? Um, and so uh, if students are able to do that, if you're solving a problem, like it could be a growth pattern problem in the lower elementary grades, or it could be, you know, um, solving some real world uh, linear equation uh, in, in the middle or high school level. Um, if a student is able to represent um, the solution to that problem in those four different ways, then they demonstrate, and see the connections between those representations, then they are demonstrating a full understanding of the concept and you're covering multiple standards as opposed and giving students this relational understanding, that connectedness, as opposed to thinking of standards as these individual and distinct things that aren't related. And then I wanna say that in the classroom, we learned, especially since COVID, I think one of the big lessons we've learned is to look at it on a, in a vertical way. So connecting with the sixth grade teacher, connecting with the seventh grade teacher and eighth grade teacher, and even some cases, elementary and high school beyond that, and saying, what are the big things that we need kids to learn considering we, we had limited time, but it serves us post COVID because now we're looking at those strands that go all the way from K through calculus. And I, and I know Dick Stanley and Tanzo Pope at UC Berkeley did a project with the AP College Board around this vertical team idea. And so I also like that about the framework where when you are pressed and you don't want to just rush through the curriculum as quickly as possible so that you cover everything, where can you find ways to sort of loop back and, and, and collapse a few things that, so that you can get through the main things so kids are successful in their next course? So I think that's the way I see it show up in the day-to-day um, -day classroom. Yeah, Kate. Okay. So I think the way, one way to, I completely agree with what Kendall and Rory just said. And one way for a layman to think about it is in terms of uh, like the filing cabinet of your brain. If you have those things cross-referenced, you have a more durable understanding and that understanding has transference. You can move it from one situation to another. That after all is the power of mathematics. It's not that when I'm graphing a line, I use this formula and then when the line happens to be vertical, I use that formula and those are all completely different things. I think Ji Sun talked a lot about this in, a, in another forum that when students see these procedures as completely separate, it's scatters their brain, and it, it, it is a drain on their mental resources. Whereas when we make these connections, it collapses that information into an actionable piece of information that we can move on. The one thing I would say about the big ideas is that they get a little confused with the mathematical practices, the drivers of investigation, and the content connections. So I'm wondering if there isn't a more streamlined way to think about these ideas that we seem to have a lot of consensus on, but I found very difficult to keep them all straight in my mind when I was reading the framework. Yeah, uh, Cole, maybe you'll explain, explain what the drivers of investigation, the standards of math practice and, uh, and connections are in relation to what Kate was just saying and why it's important and, and uh, go ahead. Yeah, so I was just, I, I think I'm going to kind of just balance between a couple of what I just heard and just okay. remind everyone that the Common Core standards were never intended to be a checklist of standards. Even in the way they are currently organized, they're organized with the cluster level with some substandards underneath, in which we've already essentially been asking teachers to focus around those ideas. We just haven't labeled them big ideas before. Um, and so we've already had that in past frameworks. That's not something that's new, it's just new language and vocabulary in the current framework. And we're now asking them to take some clusters across domains. Uh, to help bring those ideas together. 
Um, whenever I, I've engaged in a number of panels like this or with my community group, getting their feedback on what they see in the framework. And as I explain big ideas, I like to explain, like when I go out to the grocery store, I don't just walk out with my algebra brain on and say, I'm only taking my algebra hat outside with me uh, to engage in that situation. I take all of my knowledge, all the math I bring with me to engage in those environments. And that is what we're asking for teachers and students to engage with around these big ideas, bring all their funds of knowledge to the table, bring all their past experiences, all their lived experiences uh, to help them engage in the math. Um, I think it's also really important to note that these big ideas in their current state are already state board approved. Uh, they were state board approved in the digital learning and integration standard guidance in May of 2021. So these are already things that our state board has said. And as we get to learning acceleration, that this is something that we believe in as a state uh, to help bring kids forward um, and to bring schools forward. Um, yeah, so we talked about the, the balance between procedures and, and understanding concepts. And from what I can tell from looking at the uh, framework, there's a shift in emphasis here uh, to conceptual, uh, making sure students understand the conceptual basis behind the standards. But my, and, and I think that the framework is pretty, the, Brian Lindemann, you certainly can speak. I think the, the writers are pretty frank that a lot of teachers will need a lot of training in this because it's perhaps not the way that they were taught math. And now they're being asked to teach math very differently. And um, it seems like a tall order. Okay. Um, can anyone speak to that? Yeah, I'm, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm happy to, John. So I think that um, this, and this actually circles back to a prior uh, point that uh, Kate had made, which was about sort of the length of the, of the framework. I think when the writers sat down, we had visions of like prior frameworks of 200 pages and a slim trim, you know, just, you know, really, you know, get it right uh, with a minimal amount, but it expanded out over time. And part of the reason that it did was to give more evidence to what this looked like in classrooms. Um, something that's very different from this framework and the 2013 framework is the presence of vignettes. Uh, the vignettes are, are sometimes, well, most of them are multiple pages because, and part of that is, is because it's, it's an effort to capture what's happening in a classroom that is multidimensional, that is, that, that does incorporate many of the things that are called for in the, in the framework. We weren't able to create videos or do links to videos and things like that very well. CDE said that's really off the table which was uh, unfortunate. Again, we hope that technology can be more, more with us maybe in the next revision, but it's not with this one. So that was our best uh, way to sort of highlight that um, in ways that, that teachers could see, uh, not just teachers, but administrators and parents and so on, what that looks like um, in a classroom setting. And we'll see what teachers also, the amount of decision-making that they make in that short amount of time and how they incorporate students' backgrounds and facilitate conversations and so on and so forth. Um, mm -hmm. Sorry, I've talked long enough that I forgot the question, John. But I will say before you answer, <laughs> go back. I, I think you did answer, but I, I wanted you to expand on the revision process. You did refer to it as it goes back now into the revision process and we're talking 2023, what does that involve? Yeah, so so there were two, uh, there always were two 60 day public comment periods called for um, in, the, in the process. Um, those both have occurred. One occurred a year ago and one just finished this, this past spring. Uh, the frame, the, the writing team um, has been um, thanked and released for its service. And so the, the writing team is not involved in the next revisions that are gonna go forward. Um, the California Department of Education will be doing those revisions itself. Um, and so I don't have any other insight into what that process looks like. And um, I wish I did, but I, I don't. Um, I am now just another um, sort of person interested in the framework and, and, and hoping that, that the revisions um, that are gonna go forward are, again are, are, are made uh, with high quality and so on and so forth. And I'm confident that they, that they will. But that's what I can speak about that um, kind of going forward from here. Yeah, Kate, you were going to comment as well. No, no, I, I oh, have my hand up. I, oh, okay. no, I, I was going to mention funding and that the fact that this is a, because it's a recommendation and not a mandate, it's not funded. And so a lot of the changes that people want to see in mathematics classrooms require money. It requires coaches. Like I'm a coach and there's not enough coaches just for induction at this point, much less to roll out some of these initiatives. So 
coaching and support is vital. And then that needs to be funded at the state level. There was very little money that was specifically re, um, released for STEM during um, COVID. And there's learning loss um, that needs to be mitigated in mathematics. I don't know about other subjects, but definitely in mathematics, there's learning loss. And so we need, we need funding for that. If anybody from the CDE is listening. Yeah. Um, uh, Kate, actually, I, I, maybe I was asking a question in my own head and you didn't know that, uh, which is we talked uh, before. And, and I think you, you too are, um, talked about that to, to do this requires a lot of both extra work for teachers in the classroom preparing lessons, as well as the extra training. And as Rory said, and we know that over the past gen, 10 years, there's been actual very little preparation of teachers in the math standards. And so I think when we talked, you said, if they don't, they, teachers will revert to what they're comfortable with, which is what they've always taught. I wonder if you could elaborate. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I'm glad to have an opportunity to come back to what I said earlier about this being actionable. While I completely agree that we cannot continue with the status quo, I, I teach those students who come out of the high school programs. I, I know the harm, the terrible harm that's done to students. At the same time, I also know the incredible dedication of the teachers that I work with. And I know the frustration and the terror and the fear when they see something that they don't think they have the support and they don't believe that the support will come. So I have a lot of anxiety around suggestions that are directed at the legislature really saying, hey, we need more money, but are going to be imposed on teachers who do not have the, the resources to enact these very good ideas. You know, it is a wonderful idea to tell teachers, you know what you need to do? You really need to tie this into the community and have wide open-ended questions and really engage your students. But if we don't give them the facilities to do that, then they are going to revert to either what they're comfortable with or what they're uncomfortable with. And students smell that on your breath 40 miles off and they disengage. So I, I call me distrustful, but I'm a little concerned about structures that are going to put teachers who are already under a lot of pressure in a lose-lose situation. So that's, that's where my concern that I spoke of earlier. I wasn't trying to say we shouldn't be ambitious. God knows I believe yeah. we should. Yeah, Brian, come on. Oh, yeah. John, I, I did want to jump in. There are quite a few questions and, and, and comments in the, yeah. the Q&A uh, regarding equity and regarding the, the curriculum and how this math framework impacts um, and, and uh, equity. And uh, what does that mean? Um, I, I would love for um, several of you to address that. Rory, you gave a real passionate um, response earlier in, in the round table. I wonder if you might tackle that first. Um, I was reading the Q&A. Can you repeat the question? <laughs> yeah. Really, it's a question about equity and about how this math framework addresses um, the issue of equity without lowering the standards of rigor. Okay. Math. So I think that that is definitely a huge concern because when you have sort of, so I'm going to go back to tracking, which I think is where I can see institutionally, you can make that change. And how do you have acceleration? Cause I believe in acceleration. Like I think kids should have options for acceleration um, and not have tracking. So what does that look like? What are the supports around that look like? So if a, if a kid, who maybe is a little further behind decides that they want to accelerate and they want to go as far as they can go. What does that look like for us to support them? And institutionally taking a lot of that choice out of the, the, the school and the district and the teacher's hands and putting it directly in the family's hands so that then we're just there to provide the framework <laughs> for them to move as far as, as they like. And so I think in a classroom, it, it looks like having the coaching and the space to sort of deconstruct your own biases, set those aside and, and then truly believe that kids, that all kids can learn math and all kids can have sort of multiple ways to approach math. You know, so maybe I'm a visual learner, maybe I'm a, um, you know, I, I look at it algebraically better and, and really honoring that and honoring the kids thinking about the math in the classroom. But again, going back to kind of the previous thing that does take coaching and that takes support. 
because I, I'm, you know, I'm optimist. I believe all teachers want to do these things, but all teachers are not supported to do these things. Brian. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask a quick question, just follow up on something Cole was saying. So, so in the, you know, as you go along through high school, like, so there's a list of topics, right, per course. And as you say, it's, it can be challenging to cover all of them. I don't, you know, like, technically they're all supposed to be covered in practice. There are these challenges. Um, but to what extent, you know, if the teachers of a given course are going to assume the students have had that knowledge from the prior courses, how is this, at least when I read the CMF, I didn't see the guidance on how do we manage this reality that uh, at least it seemed to me that one of the valuable things in the CMF could have been to give teachers guidance on how to efficiently cover topics so that we can have that knowledge to be built upon from year to year. Yeah, no, that, I mean, that's fair, Brian. Um, I think that as we're thinking about, I think about just the high school. So I get to support K-12 teachers in my, in my area. I work with lots of teachers at all, all different levels. Um, and oftentimes when I meet with our high school folks, one of the number one concerns is I have all of this to cover and no time to even cover all the things that were in my current course. And so we're already confounded with this problem, right? So regardless of what's happening in the new framework, even looking at past frameworks that didn't give much guidance at all for high school, um, we are kind of stuck to be honest with you, right? So, so what is that path forward? How do we move past this? Um, and I think that it's going to take some some planning time. It's going to take some vertical articulation, uh, as Rory mentioned. We're going to have to build that time in um, and that guidance and support so we know where those handoffs are happening. Um, but again, that's going to be potentially dependent upon local decision and what pathway that they are choosing. Um, and I think a lot of that support may not be in the document, but will come in the rollout support that will come from a various level, right? So I think that there's the document that is setting the guidance forward. And then there's what happens after this document is published and approved, which would be the statewide rollout um, through county offices or through different development agencies uh, to support what it actually looks like in practice. So I think this is the, the start of that conversation. Yeah, Brian, Kate, then we want to turn to high school math. Yep, Kendall, no high school man. Yes, high school. Kendall was first. Kendall. Yeah, I've right, had my hand up. For, yeah, I've had my hand up for a while. So yeah, sorry I wanted that. to uh, address the whole equity issue as well, and looking at it from a much more systemic um, uh, perspective, and how structures are in place that actually inhibit students of color from taking advanced mathematics, whether it's uh, staffing at, I mean, you have two different situations going on. If a, if a student of color is at a high poverty school, then the issue is whether or not there's even a teacher there who can teach the course, right? Or whether they have, you know, there's this, all this talk about teacher shortages for the 35 years that I've been in education there's always been a shortage of qualified teachers at urban schools, so that's nothing new, right? And then when you talk about um, students who then go to high-performing, students of color who go to high-performing affluent schools, then these roadblocks and gates are put in place that restrict their access to the high-level math courses, right? Um, you know, they there are these uh, criteria like a te they have to get a signature from a teacher to say that allows them to go on to the next course and that's very subjective and very arbitrary on the ways that teachers write so when we think about equity I have to look at at outcomes and I want uh, to see a situation where I shouldn't be able to determine the outcome, a student's mathematical outcome based upon their race, their gender, their ability, their language uh, uh, capability, right? Um, everyone should be able to have unfettered access to all to uh, whatever uh, mathematics coursework that they would like to have access to. Uh, Brian Lindemann. I wanted to circle back to, to something that uh, Brian had, uh, Brian Conrad had, had mentioned, and that's a, a, a of course, a fundamental question, which is what do we do with the limited time that teachers have? I mean, that's, that's, of course, we can be very, you know, aspirational and very thoughtful, and we hope we have been and what's in the framework, but, but there, there are those hard realities. Um, one thing that, that is mentioned in, in there, of course, many times is the idea that big ideas can really hopefully capture multiple standards in one fell swoop. 
And I think that's very different than the 2013 framework in which like Kendall was mentioning before is more kind of a standard by standard based. I'll do one standard per day or something like that and not connected very well together with other things. There's ways that we can be more efficient in how we present the content and how students then again, form connections with other related topics, I think. Because uh, it can also help in terms of how long the learning lasts. As we know, we've known for 60 years since you know, Piaget that, that, that when students form you know, connections to other topics in their brain, those don't go away. I mean, they keep those and moreover, those structures can then be built upon. And, and that's really what we're trying to do um, you know, more uh, now. And I think, so I think there's hopefully, and, you know, um, you know, room for that, more room for that in this, in this current framework. Yeah. Um, Kendall, when, in our, in an article that, that I wrote, you talked about the idea of going uh, slow to go fast, which is to say that you one gets the, uh, the concepts once, and that takes time, takes perhaps extra time. But once you grasp that, then things make sense to students and you can proceed quickly and uh, towards the end of the year. And I, I guess, and I think, I hope I summarize that right. But my question to, to Brian, you've been criti critical of some of the research, Brian Conrad, some of the research in the framework. Does that make sense to you? No, what you said, I, I, I completely agree with. What, okay. what, I mean, the, the idea, of course, certainly when you build on my comments about the, the the research had to do with just a paper was cited to say one thing and said something else, right? I was not, in fact, I said very explicitly in my comments, I wasn't passing judgment on the validity of the research or anything about that, just on the accuracy of how things are described. But anyway, coming back to your question, mm -hmm. certainly I, I I think you'd find most people, math, mathematicians and people with, with math education would, would agree that, yeah, when you have the deeper understanding of the concept, you can right. build on that and go much faster. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Kate, Before we, one more comment before we jump to high school. Uh, I think Rory had her hand up. I don't know if it's- Oh, to sorry, this. Rory didn't sit yeah. Oh, Kate, you can go. I mean, I can talk on the next one. I'll be quick. So I think, again, for the lay people uh, out there, I think one way to understand this is to think of that dreaded functional notation, right? If we spend some time really making students comfortable with functional notation, we have to do this at the university level. Like, what is revenue? That's a function. Forget about the expression. It's, you, there's an input and here's an output. If we go slow there, we spend a whole day or in college, so maybe a week in high school, talking really carefully about what that functional notation means, we reap the benefits of that for the next three years, right? If we rush through that and we don't have a solid understanding, we waste time coming back and moreover, there's knowledge that we have to undo, which is extremely expensive. And one of the things I really loved about the framework was the places where they pointed out the value of not yet right answers. Oh, that's a paraphrase. But, and that's a big equity question. If you are only paying attention to the students who shout out that right answer first, then you are biasing yourself towards the people who trust the system and who are benefiting from the system. If instead you focus on the not yet right questions, you can choose amongst them. And this is a place where Zoom really helped us because you could have everybody answer the question anonymously to you and you could choose the juiciest not yet right question. Because when somebody says the right answer, the discussion's over. When somebody, when you unpack what's not yet right, and you go back over how those not yet right things helped us really have a deep, deep understanding, then you're honoring everybody in the classroom, and you're lit, you're you're really holding them up in the value of their contribution. And I found that that's been the biz the biggest equity gain for me in my classroom. Thanks, Cole. One last comment, and then Rory. Can I, can I do my comment next? Sorry, <laughs> can I go next? Is that fine. And you want you want to? Yeah, I want to go next. Yeah. So um, to 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 sort of jump on um, what Kate was saying is that, and and then also what it looks like in a classroom is that, especially with COVID, I think that was like a, a the deepest version of this. Where I mean, people were all over the place, and so I feel like you know, in the beginning, I think of my classroom as a boat, and you know, we can't leave people in the water, we can't leave people on the dock. You got to kind of slow down, but at the same time provide rigor for those kids that are done. So, you know, as we all know, any one topic, you could spend the rest of your life on. So there's always deeper learning for a kid to do if you're kind of slowing the boat down and letting the other kids catch up with sort of more of the surface things. And then as you move along, if you're, if you're, to me, my classroom is successful, 
when I'm planning lessons in April and they're done quick, which means that they've sped up, that they've kind of all on board with certain fundamental things and then they can go on. Also, I will say to Brian's previous point is technology is a big way to speed things up because I'm able to look, for example, at Desmos and look at the screen and say, oh, I can see we're so, so, so. It's like a lot of just nonstop ongoing in like real time formative assessment. And that allows me to very quickly see where we need to course correct within class, which also speeds up the process. So I would say that the last point to pull all these things together is that we need the support and time to look at what works in our classrooms, to share those best practices, having teachers teach teachers and, and then, and then kind of say, okay, this is what's working for our students. Let's all do that. But we need the time and resources to be able to, to do that. And then really look at what's important in the curriculum you know, pull out those things so that you aren't pushing kids on and they don't know the fundamentals they need to be successful in the next course. But we need the time and resources to extrapolate a lot of that. Cool. Yeah. So this conversation kind of spiraled towards the high school and towards tracking, but I want to jump before we jump all the way there to talk more about like our K-8 and kind of what this looks like in there. And I think that it's really important um, as we think about our youngest of learners, you know, our K-1-2s, our K-3s, about what this framework is calling out around um, number sense and about bringing in this idea of math talks and number strings and flexibility. Uh, For far too long, we've had um, our understanding of fluency as how fast I was able to answer 100 questions on a multiplication test. This framework, for the first time, clearly calls out that that is not a best practice and opens up doors um, for kids to kind of think and build um, on that understanding. Um, And it brings voice to the room. Voices that haven't been heard before or that maybe have been silently sitting in the back of the classroom, they are now being represented and heard and not even that being recorded on the board for having these great ideas. And that builds their self-confidence, their efficacy, their mindset around what they can do. And it changes this. I'm not a mathematician. I don't belong because I don't remember that one regurgitated process uh, into a, my idea was validated and it was built on by peers. Right. We're, we're creating that sense of equity through this approach. And I think it's a really important, especially for us, our youngest of learners who are then going to go up through the system. Thank you. Um, we really needed two sessions, one on K-8 and one on high school. But let's see what we can do in our time that's remaining. Um, and we talked about the pressure of a students feel that uh, to do calculus, whether or not they're going to major in STEM. And in some high schools, you can't do uh, you can't get the calculus, perhaps not offered for all students. And but. But here's a broader question, if you will. You know, how much math, including Algebra 2, should all students have to pursue whatever field or pursuit that they choose? Can anyone start off on that to lay out this discussion? Kate. So in 2014, the CSU had a task force called the Quantitative Reasoning Task Force and they created a report um, that really dug into the common core standards, which were fairly new at that time, and said, what would a student who's going to uh, want to have the full opportunity of the CSU, what would they really need to have a solid foundation on in order to thrive in the CSU or the community college? And we came up with a, with a, a, a description called Uh, foundational quantitative reasoning, and it was based off of where we hoped a student would ultimately end up at the end of their four years, so backtracking that and looking at nursing, teaching, law enforcement, as well as STEM. So opportunity to STEM within the CSU means you you take pre-calculus when you come to the CSU. And uh, Phil Darrow was on that committee. There was community college representation, high school representation. And that boiled down to roughly what happens up through 10th grade math under the Common Core. But of course, you you need to be fluent on that. You do not become fluent in something by simply doing up till that and stopping. So in some sense, what what we should do after Algebra 1 Geometry or Integrated Math 1 and 2, what we should be doing is really building those skills by deepening them, by doing something more. And so Algebra 2 has been the something more. But maybe what we need to do is look towards other ways to get through that critical content that is in Algebra 2. Maybe there's some content in Algebra 2 that's not critical. 
and then also consolidating that, that sophistication and that knowledge in other ways. So I would refer people to that Quantitative Reasoning Task Force report, um, mostly Recommendation 2, uh, A, B, and C, that spell out where we hope students are going to land and where we hope they come to us, because that was already done within the framework, uh, within the, the task force report, and it was a little dispiriting that that was not, that didn't show up at all in the framework. John, um, let me jump in. I, I don't know if sorry, you're- Sorry, I was mute because there was background noise. I, I just wanted to get, uh, uh, sorry about that. Uh, Brian, uh, Conrad and Kindle to, to talk about this important issue. Yeah, I just wanted just to add one thing, which is, you know, so there is discussion about, um, you know, having maybe a variety of choices for the 12th grade math course, for example. Um, and And I think, you know, one thing that could be very valuable is if one focuses on, the con you can have the same content be learned in different contexts. And so it may be the case that, you know, for example, if we take data science, for instance, I mean, current courses in data science, the, the mathematical content coverage is not so much, but one could imagine those examples being used to illustrate a variety of ideas. So in any event, I guess what I just wanted to suggest is one avenue towards uh, keeping a broad array of options available in college, but for students with many different interests, could be something along the lines of trying to promote the development of courses that cover roughly similar types of content, but maybe using in very different contexts. But of course, this all requires resources, so it can be very challenging. But maybe the same material can be learned in very different ways is a useful thing to keep in mind. Yeah, well, let me ask you before we go, why is it that the STEM professionals in their letters were so concerned about either the alternatives or the data science that was presented in well, that framework? I mean, that, that, okay, just, they said that just, has consumed a lot of, of well, uh, yeah. their the, objections. The basic concern was just, as I said, the courses as they currently exist, it's about looking what content is covered. And, and so that's kind of where the concern comes from, that in those courses, there's a certain amount of statistical content, but the algebra and the logarithms and so on are not there. And so it's just hard to see how is the student going to be ready going forward to enter into these fields, let's say if they want to complete their degree in four years. Kind of. Yeah, I, I really was intrigued by something that Kate said, because I'm also interested in what is that critical content of Algebra 2 that we think students need to know if they're not planning a STEM career? Like if somebody's going into journalism or the arts or the social sciences, what is it in that Algebra 2 content that we think is really critical for them to know? Uh, because I worked very closely with the uh, introduction to data science course. I did not, I was not one of the writers of the course, but I did, re I was one of the entities that received the California Math Readiness Challenge Initiative Grant, where we implemented data science as a senior level math course in a local uh, district, in a local school district, and had really good outcomes in terms of helping students not only meet their graduation requirements, but their UC or C. CSU entrance requirements, right? So, you know, I'm really supportive of these alternative course pathways. Uh, and so, again, I'm just really interested in that question as well. What's that critical content of Algebra 2 that we think students need to know that, you know, w sh w would need to be in included in any course uh, above Algebra 2? So, uh, I think that was, is it okay? Yeah, I to you. Sure. So I think that what it's not is adding a cubic over a quartic to a heptic over a septic and factoring everybody and finding how definitely that is something that might be useful in, in, in uh, Calc 2, but even that's fairly questionable, okay? So I think there's a lot of content that exists that, that clearly is very specific to calculus preparation, and since we have pre-calculus, I think we could be more efficient. Um, but there are other things like rational functions and really thinking about rational functions and logarithms and exponents that typically get done more deeply in Algebra 2. And so those things, I think, fit very well, as, as Brian, Brian were saying, into fairly different streams. But the, the, the problem comes in the trust. Do we trust that these alternatives, and I'm not going to call them pathways, I really 
think we need to get away from pathways which can be troughs rather than paths, and we need to think about options of courses, none of which are dead ends. So I do two years of statistics, but I make sure that that critical Algebra two content happens within those two years, or I take a year of statistics and then I do pre-calculus, or I do lots of different options, not troughs. Mm -hmm. I, I, don't, I didn't answer your question, Kindle, because I think that that's exactly what I think is missing from the framework, is really that hard choice about what we're emphasizing and what we're de-emphasizing. And that's controversial, but I think that we need to do it. Otherwise, we're asking teachers an impossible task. From what I understand um, w from reading and from listening to, to all of you, is that one of the issues is the signals that students receive at various times in high school. And that particularly at the end of 10th grade, if you're not going to pursue Algebra 2 or the traditional pathways, that would be really clear to whatever you take what are the implications by if you change your mind, for example, and want to become a STEM major or something else, are you going to be behind when you graduate from, from high school? And I think that's one of the questions raised is, is it going to be transparent and clear along the way? Am I, do I have that right? Someone? I mean, to me, yeah. to Kendall's point earlier, I, I did not know that I was going to major in math when I was in high school. Like if you had asked me, I wouldn't have even been able to say that. And I didn't know I'd say until after my first year at Berkeley that I wanted to do math because I encountered this very dynamic um, who was a, you know, a, a graduate student from Morehouse who basically told us all we were going to be math majors and then we were. So, um, so I would say what, what concerns me about um, leaving that as an option is it can be further tracking. Um, I agree with Kendall in the sense that you know, we need to have better access points for all students in mathematics at high school level. Um, but, I, but I would say that it concerns me when we're leaving that up to a counselor to direct a student into a particular course that then when they decide, hey, I'd really like to be an engineer. Now I have to go to community college to take this Algebra 2 course that isn't offered at Berkeley or isn't offered at UCLA or, or on these campuses like the UC campuses for sure. And then I also find out <clears throat> that those courses don't give me credit. It's a pass, not pass. It doesn't impact my GPA. And now I have to pay more money to go along the path that if somebody had told me, hey, keep all your options open um, and you have to take, at least say you have to take these classes and then you have full options when you get into the um, University of California. So that's my big concern with that. But I do agree with um, Kendall that the, um, the access in high school and sort of the, 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 the excitement about mathematics can be a little bit more diverse. Brian Lindemann. Yes, I certainly agree with Kendall as well, Rory. Um, I, I guess I just wanted to, to, to say a couple of things just in, in relation. I totally agree with Rory that a lot of this has to do with counseling at the high school level. It sounds like an interesting place to focus on, but I think a lot of that does come down to the, to the signals that students are given, not just by counselors, but by teachers and so on and so forth. I'm just going to read a little bit um, from the statement from, from Harvard. Uh, is there a specific math requirement? Applicants to Harvard should excel in a challenging high school math sequence corresponding to their educational interests and aspirations. Rigorous and relevant data science, computer science, statistics, mathematical modeling, calculus, and other advanced math classes are given equal consideration in the application process. It goes on to describe further about calculus. Specifically, it's neither a requirement nor a preference for admission. And it explains that even further. Explicit statements like that from higher education institutions that are respected, I think helps greatly uh, in terms of getting the message across to counselors and to high schools that, that we're all a little nervous about this shift. I think I'm nervous too. I love calculus. I love it deeply. But I'm nervous too about the fact that, I mean, whenever a system is undergoing change, you're nervous about what's going to happen next. But I think there are ways that we can sort of open up more possibilities and draw more students in, in ways that are helpful. Um, the, 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 my second point just about higher ed also, the responsibility that higher ed has here, which is obviously big upon high school. Um, the second piece is that uh, pre-service teacher programs also are gonna play a big role in this. And I would, I would hope that the framework can help inform some pre-service teacher programs 
um, and, and, and what they do and how they train teachers. That obviously would help us all a great deal uh, rather than have leave this all to professional development. And, you know, there's lots of wonderful coaches out there, Cole, Rory, there's, there's wonderful people out there that could do great work. Um, but we can't just leave it all to that. We have to also set the stage in pre-service teacher programs. Too. Thank you. Yeah, um, before we go, yeah, Anne, can we go a couple minutes more? <laughs> yeah, we're at the hour. We, we certainly can go a, a, a little over. Um, I did want to address a couple of questions showing up in the chat regarding um, teacher prep. So with new expectations comes additional work. And so, you know, if we can, you know, as we, you know, look to conclude, look at what teachers need and what tools they should have and how they can be supported. Well, you know, I think that teachers are, for, for many people, for many teachers, what we're asking them to do uh, in the framework, even with the Common Core, was very different than the kind of mathematics that they experienced. And so it's going to really require, um, you know, teacher education programs, math methods courses to um, change what they're doing to align to what the uh, framework uh, is calling for uh, as we end. You know, I work for an organization that does professional development in the state of California. I'm also mandated to support and implement the California, California math framework. So it's in, incumbent upon me and all of my uh, 19 site directors to be fully versed in the framework so that we can support the schools and districts in our regions as well. Yeah, Cole. Well, I think it's just really important to acknowledge that a lot of the ideas, especially in the earlier chapters of the framework, are already things that districts have invested some professional development in. So it's not all going to be brand new. The big ideas piece, the course connect, the content connections, all of that will be new uh, as we roll this out. Um, and we're going to definitely need support, not only from coaches and such, but we're also going to need curriculum developers to, to do their part in this problem too. Because if we don't get high quality resources, that are in alignment with what this framework is asking us to do, it, we're in trouble. Because um, there's not gonna be time for teachers to sit there and develop every big idea in a series of, that just, it's not reasonable. So there's a huge task and ask here of publishers to also respond to this call. But I just want to acknowledge there are a lot of districts that have already devoted to things like math talks and counting collections and number strings. And they're already doing lots of these things that are called for. So. I just wanted to point that out that districts aren't, they're already moving in some of these things, even before the framework was drafted. Yeah, Brian Conrad. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, just to give another illustration in terms of the challenges when teachers are being asked to teach things that are, you know, kind of new to them. If we think about like uh, data science and computer science based math courses, uh, such as there's another state which has a pathway centered around data and computer science uh, within the math curriculum. And those courses are labeled as saying these are for students who will not need calculus later. And maybe if a teacher doesn't know what comes down the road, you know, that might inform how they do things. But if you're going to get degrees in those fields, you have to have the skills to pick up calculus pretty early in college. So while they're being trained to focus on the material they're currently teaching, it's also helpful to the extent of some awareness of what's coming downstream so they can know what skills their students should be ready to pick up later. Okay. One, one last question, if I can, for all of you, and, and that is um, sort of summarize a, a, a for us. You know, what would you like, either pick, pick a choice, what would you like to see preserved in this current framework? What would you like to see changed? Or is there, from our discussion, some middle ground that you can advise the State Board of Education? Because there's been a lot of divisiveness on this, on the framework. What, what middle ground do you see? And, and each of you, if you can answer however you want. Succinctly. <laughs> Succinctly, thank you, Anne. So I'll jump in first. Yeah. Um, I think that based on what I've heard today and you know, taking the various um, insights and things that we bring to the table, I'll say that it sounds like we all agree that it needs to be student-centered. And sometimes that means the adults getting out of the way for us to do what's best for kids. And so as long as at the end of the day, that is what comes through into light in this framework so that it brings equity and choice and options for kids to, and to bring more kids into the math field, I would say that this, this framework is a success. Rory, do you have any thoughts about then what would you like to make sure is preserved in this framework moving forward? Well, so the number one thing I would say that would be preserved is, would be detracking. I think that's vital. And then we 
move forward to come up with solutions to provide acceleration opportunities for all students at different levels. Um, the other thing that is a takeaway is that we can't keep, you know, trying to make a dollar out of 15 cents. Like at some point, you know, these, these great ideas in the framework and, and, and I think the direction we need to move towards needs to be funded and it needs to be supported. So um, because, you know, we're, you know, if you want to ask, we're not doing well, teachers are not doing well, people are overstretched, overworked um, post COVID. And so the more, more boots on the ground, the more bodies in the classrooms, math body, math teacher bodies <laughs> that we can get, I think will be the best for our students in the long run. All right. Thank you. Brian Lindemann, I know that you must want to preserve something. You spent a year of your time writing it. Well, uh, three years. Uh, <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a lot of wonderful things to preserve, um, certainly, and I and I hope that 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 is. I mean, I think there's a lot of things that we've mentioned before around equity and bringing more students into mathematics, creating more love of mathematics at uh, students of all grade levels. I know that's something that we all share, certainly on this panel, is a deep love of math, and we want to see positive math learning for everyone. The more about the details of how that unfolds, I think we can differ in our opinions about that. But I think that's what we want to see, and I, and I, and certainly, I think the acknowledgement that that love of mathematics can also happen and, and needs to happen with the learning of the math. That it's really hard when we disconnect those two things from each other. That some how much someone likes a subject is interwoven inextricably with how well they do in the in the subject. And so I think again, we need to be mindful of where students are at you know, uh, you know, mentally, emotionally, when they come into, you know, learning math experiences. I think it's, I think it's really incumbent. Uh, Thank you. Um, Brian Conrad, and, and link to your critique will be on our resource page for those who want to read, uh, as I did. Um, what you so wrote. I, oh, sorry, yeah, so I guess two quick things would be, so I, I second what Rory said about providing uh, guidance on acceleration options, ideally, you know, multiple ways in, right? Like the student may, their interests may evolve over high school and then they say, oh, now I want to accelerate or reach calculus in 12th grade, whatever it may be. So giving guidance based on experience in many places about what ways work to, to provide students with pathways into that. And then related to that is giving uh, more clarity about the uh, downstream consequences of choices of courses students may make. That uh, if you do this, then these are open, or if you do that, you may need to come back to something later, but some more clarity about that and more clarity on grade level information so it's easier to navigate. Thank you. Kindle. I also want to agree with Rory that um, I think we need to uh, maintain this commitment to in tracking. Um, we do not need to move backwards. That would be a huge move backwards. And I also hope that we continue to offer um, multiple options for students at the high school level to complete their college preparatory math curriculum. Thank you. Kate, last word. Thanks. Uh, what I want to preserve is the idea of not boring kids to death and then using their tolerance of that boredom as a filter for who goes on to STEM. That I think is something that comes out strongly that we really need to ignite the enthusiasm of our students and reach the students where they're at. Uh, what I, the way I think that we can do that is through something that came up. We need to talk to all the constituents. We need university faculty speaking respectfully with high school faculty, with community college faculty, so that we can all understand. It's only through working together on a common purpose with respect, with equal partnership, that we can really come to some kind of understanding and then move forward with a solution. And I think we've heard a lot of them today. Thank you. I turn it to you, Anne. Yes. Well, I want to thank everyone on this panel for your conversation, for your insight, and for your time. And again, thanks to our funders, including the Gates Foundation, for making today's roundtable happen.